my name is Melissa. Um, I am a registered pharmacist in a PharmD, and I am going to be talking with everyone today about um, understanding insurance in order to better be able to help our clients here. Um, and so we'll really just go through the very basics. Um, this is just going to be explaining the different kinds of insurance. But of course, if there's any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Um, and then as you guys are actually helping our clients, if you have any questions, you can always see myself or Marlene um, just for more information and more detailed information about insurance. Um, so to start off with, we're just going to go over some very basic terms. So these terms, um, you'll be you'll hear a lot and so I feel like it's very important for everyone to kind of know what they mean so we know what we're talking about. So the first one is a premium and what a premium is is just a standard monthly cost that a client is going to pay to actually have the insurance. Um, so you know for example if a premium is $50 that patient or that client is paying $50 every single month just to be able to have that insurance regardless if they're actually picking up medications or using that insurance in general. The second term is a copay. Um, this is representing what the patient is actually paying for their medications. So a lot of times when clients go to the pharmacy um, or if they go to the doctor's office, they'll have a set copay and that's just what they are responsible for the doctor's visit. The other um, term is a coinsurance. So this is very similar to a copay. However, the only difference is, is that the copay is a set amount. So for example, a copay is $10 or $25 for a specific service, whereas a coinsurance is going to be more so the percentage of the total cost of either a medication or a doctor's office visit. So if a patient has a 10% coinsurance on a medication and that medication is $100, then that patient will be responsible for paying $10. Um, whereas vice versa, if they have a coinsurance of say 50%, then and that medication costs $100, they would then have to pay $50 for that medication. So the coinsurance is really more so a percentage of the total cost, where the copay is more so a set cost of the medication. And then the last term that we're going to go over is the formulary. So a formulary is a list of medications that your insurance has decided to approve um, on their formulary. So these are the medications that your insurance will cover in the event um, that they are prescribed to them. If they are not on formulary, then that means that the insurance is not going to be covering those medications. So it's a set list that the insurance company comes up with, um, and that list just says all the medications that are either covered they're not on that list, and that means they are not covered by the insurance. Any questions? Uh, I just have a quick question. Sure. I want to know about um, the copay and the coinsurance. Yeah. If someone has um, a private insurance or, I guess, Medicare or anything like that, do they, are they expected to pay both the copay in addition to coinsurance, or is it one or the other? Is that? It's one or the other, so that's a really good question. So every insurance, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance through your employer, Every insurance is going to have a copay or a coinsurance. So you are not, people who have insurance are not required to pay both. Um, it's just based upon their insurance whether or not they set a copay or if they have a coinsurance. But it's not going to be both, it's going to be one or the other. Okay, thank you. Good question. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are just uninsured options. Um, so for those who don't have insurance, um, these are different things. and different programs that we have in order to help them um, get their medications at a lower cost. So obviously the first one, self-pay. Um, so if a person doesn't have insurance or even if they do have insurance and a particular doctor or medication is not covered, that patient can opt to pay out of their own pocket full price for either the doctor's visit or the medication. Um, and if they don't have insurance, then obviously that's the early option because they don't have any additional help um, for getting the medication. Um, but we do have programs that do help people who don't have insurance. One of them is the 340V drug discount. Um, so this is actually a Medicaid rebate program in which patients can go to these clinics and get medications and services at a lower cost um, than what they would if they were paying full price at like a pharmacy. Um, so for instance, insulin is something that, you know, obviously we're helping patients obtain. Insulin is very expensive. So if patients do not have insurance, 
Insulin can cost anywhere of up to like $700 for a box of insulin, which is crazy. Um, but through the 340B drug discount, they can actually get the box of insulin for a significantly lower cost um, than that $700. And that is because of that Medicaid um, rebate that the 340B clinics provide. The other thing that um, is really beneficial for people who don't have insurance is the charity care. Um, and this is actually a program that's associated with most hospitals in the area. Um, they provide discounted services for people who do not have insurance. It's all income based, so they would need to go and talk with that particular hospital and their charity care program um, and determine whether or not what they, what they would qualify. But if they do, then they would be able to obtain services um, they'd be able to see a doctor. A lot of charity care has um, CDEs as well as endocrinologists, and they would be able to get this um, either free of charge or at a very reduced price than seeing, say, a doctor, you know, just in a general practice or a private practice. So that's a really good option for people who, one, don't have insurance, and two, um, need to set up care to see a doctor in order to get their medications and lab work and things and checks. So um, both of these are really great options for people who do not have insurance. First type of insurance that we're gonna talk about is private insurance. So this is the insurance that you're either obtaining from and, or that people are obtaining from an employer or um, they obtain this from the marketplace. Um, then they would be able to obtain services. Um, they'd be able to see a doctor. A lot of charity care has um, CDEs as well as endocrinologists, and they would be able to get this um, either free of charge or at a very reduced price than seeing, say, a doctor, you know, just in a general practice or a private practice. So that's a really good option for people who, one, don't have insurance, and two, um, need to set up care to see a doctor in order to get their medications and lab work and things in check. So um, both of these are really great options for people who do not have insurance. So basically, this is gonna apply mostly to people who are under the age of 65, um, because 65 is that cutoff for Medicare. So people who are under the age of 65 can either apply for insurance through the marketplace or they obtain insurance through their employers. Um, and those, that's just saying like the employer insurance and then the Affordable Care Act is referring to that marketplace. The next type of insurance is Medicare. So we kind of talked about that 65 cutoff age. Once a person turns 65, they get automatically enrolled into Medicare. And what Medicare is, is a federally funded health insurance program um, for those who are 65 and older or if they are disabled. And there's some criteria for disability about whether or not they qualify, but that's getting into more detail. Um, but basically there are four parts of Medicare. There's Part A, Part B, Part C, and Part D. Part A and B, people are automatically enrolled in when they turn the age of 65. Part C and D, people have to actively enroll in that um, once they turn 65 because they don't automatically get it. So Part A is going to cover the hospital and doctor's office visits. Part B covers your durable medical equipment. So when we're talking about diabetics, that includes the test strips, lancets, and the meter. So all of that is covered by Part B. Um, Part C is what is known as Medicare Advantage or Medigap. And what that is, is it's basically a bundle of your medical insurance and prescription insurance all in one. So this is what they refer to as a PPO or Preferred Provider Organization. So this, these plans have set um, doctors that they prefer their patients to see, and if they go outside of those doctors, then it's a higher cost to the patient in order to do so. So Part C is a bundle of both medical and prescription, whereas Part D is just prescription only. So remember, with A, Part A and B, you are getting coverage for doctor and hospital visits. Um, and Part D kind of provides that additional prescription drug coverage as well. So, so Part D will give them that additional prescription drug coverage, um, where Part C, it's a bundle between the two. So that's the biggest difference. 
you'll most often see people who have a Part D plan versus people who have Part C. Part C is not as common as Part D is. Um, and then supplemental plans that go in addition with Medicare is the ADRC, which is the Aging and Disability um, Resource Connection, Senior Gold, and then the Pharmaceutical Assistance of the Aged and Disabled. So all of these are supplemental plans that will help lower patient costs for medications and hospital and doctor's office visits to an even lower price um, than what they would get with just Medicare itself. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, can I have a question? Sure. Um, and I'm interested in, in knowing about this. Yeah. Um, for Part D, mm -hmm. um, are there any prescription medications like insulin um, that are not covered under Part D that we should be aware of that we help um, recipients to, to acquire? So kind of think back to what we were talking about with the formulary earlier. So that formulary is that specific list of medications that um, your insurance either covers or it doesn't cover, right? Okay. So Medicare and Medicare Part D, depending on which insurance plan they have, so Medicare Part D, there are like hundreds of Part D plans. So depending on which plan that patient chooses to enroll in will determine whether or not a particular insulin is covered or not. So it's gonna be different based on which plan they pick um, because each insurance formulary has a different list of medications that they'll cover versus what they won't cover. So for example, Humana and United Healthcare are two of the biggest Part D plans. I see them all the time. Um, and so Humana probably has a different drug formulary than United Healthcare does. So if a patient is on, let's say Lantus for example, Humana might cover Lantus, but United Healthcare may not. It really just depends on what's on their formulary. Okay. So it's going to vary from plan to plan. Okay. All right, so we can go ahead and move to the next slide. So the next thing we're going to talk about um, is just more so the things that Medicare Part B covers in relation to um, patients with diabetes. So the great thing about Medicare um, and Medicare Part B in general is that it really does cover a lot of um, the durable medical equipment as well as specific screenings for um, patients with diabetes. So that's really important because we want to make sure that the clients that we're helping are really utilizing everything that their insurance covers for them. Um, so things that are really important, so we talked about equipment and supplies, um, you know, someone with diabetes, they have to have a glucometer, they have to have test strips and lancets in order to test their blood sugar and make sure that it's within range or we need to make adjustments. Um, but the other great thing that it also covers is the therapeutic shoes and inserts. So patients with diabetes have to have very specialized footwear in order to make sure that um, they're getting the support and compression that they need. Um, so Medicare Part B actually does cover that. And then a big thing with diabetes and one of the big risk factors that can come from diabetes is glaucoma. So Medicare Part B covers glaucoma screenings as well, which is awesome. Um, the other thing that Medicare Part B will cover is education services. So we're talking like self-management training, um, as well as any kind of medical nutrition therapy um, that our clients may need. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. I feel like we get so set on trying to get them their medications that we often forget about the additional screenings that they should probably get. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind and you know that's something that's coming free of charge or at a very low cost to them because it is covered by Part B. Um, so it's definitely something we want to make sure that they're utilizing. All right, so next slide. Okay, um, the last thing we're going to talk about with Medicare is the donut hole, also known as the coverage gap. Um, so the donut hole is probably one of the biggest um, hurdles of Medicare. Basically what the donut hole or the coverage gap is, is when a insurance plan has paid a certain amount towards a patient's medications, um, they go into what they call the coverage gap in which a patient is expected to pay either full price or a very higher cost for their medications until they make their way out of the donut hole. Um, so, not to try to go into too much detail, but to give you guys an idea of what that number is, um, insurance will pay $3,750 towards a patient's medications before they hit that donut hole. 
once they hit that donut hole, they expect a patient to pay $1,250 to pay their way out of the donut hole. Once they have paid that amount, if they do pay that amount, um, they will go out of the donut hole and then their insurance will kick back in. So for $1,250, patients don't have you know, prescription coverage, let's say, even though they do have insurance because their insurance is requiring them to pay that amount to pay their way out of the donut hole. So you can imagine $1,250 is a lot of money for clients and that is one of the biggest hurdles and obstacles that we try to overcome and help our clients with um, to figure out different ways to you know help get out of that donut hole or at least help to get them to the end of the year um, the donut hole does reset starting January 1st so if you have a patient who goes into the donut hole in December and they you know don't pay that 1250 once January 1st hits they will that donut hole will reset and they'll start back with their original coverage. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. If you guys have any more questions about that, you can definitely come see me. Um, but this is gonna be a huge thing that you see with a lot of our clients, and it typically happens starting the middle to the end of the year. Um, especially people who are on Lantus, that's brand name medication. Like I said before, $700 a box. Um, if you're only having to pay $100 a box a month for it, your insurance is paying that $600. And that $600 every single month really adds up quickly that the insurance is paying. Um, so definitely something to look out for. And we do have really great resources and programs to help these patients during this time. So, all right, next slide. All right, and then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about Medicaid. Um, so Medicaid is a state-funded um, program, insurance program um, for low-income patients. So the New Jersey program is the NJ Family Care. Um, because it is state-funded, it differs from state to state. So what our requirements for New Jersey Medicaid is gonna differ from what New York Medicaid is or what Pennsylvania Medicaid is. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, Medicare, federal, so it's going to be the same all across the board. Medicaid is state to state, so just keep that in the back of your minds. Um, but it is only for low income participants, so it is going to be based on the patient's income about whether or not they will qualify. But if you have somebody who says that they're low income, that they're either not working and they're not drawing um, or getting a lot of money in month to month, this should definitely be something that you check into with them or have them check into to see whether or not they would qualify. Medicaid typically has very good coverage on most things. Um, so co-pays are as little to five to eight dollars um, on most medications, depending on what it is. And then most services for hospital or doctor's office visits are covered or either very, very low charge. So very good insurance coverage here if the patient qualifies based on their income. Um, Supplemental plans in addition to Medicaid, uh, so we have the Children's Health Insurance Plan or program or CHIP. Um, you have the Medicaid Managed Long-Term Services and Supports. Um, Long-Term Supports or NJ Family Care, which is the main, the main umbrella of Medicaid in New Jersey itself. The NJ Workability, um, you have Emergency Payment Program for Aliens, um, so especially those who are uninsured and are undocumented, um, that would be great for them. And then you also have the CHAMP VA, which is um, a supplemental plan that is specific to um, veterans. Um, so that's a great program for them as well. Any questions about that? No? Um, can I just ask the last question? Sure. Um, regarding, regarding Medicaid, um, are there also co-pays um, for Medicaid? Is it like similar to other types of insurance? Yeah, so every, most insurances, like I said, those terms we kind of talked about before about the premium and the deductible um, and the co-pay and co-insurance are going to apply to all insurances. Okay. So um, Medicaid actually doesn't have the premium, so if they qualify for Medicaid, then they don't have to pay anything to obtain the insurance. They automatically get it. but most cases um, they will have a copay but it's usually only like i think it's like five dollars for generics and then eight dollars for brands right so you're talking if someone is on lantis and it's normally um seven hundred dollars a box for insulin 
then with Medicaid, it's only $8. Okay. So it's very, very good coverage, but a copay is still there. It's just at a very lower cost. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And um, but Medicaid doesn't have that donut hole that we were talking about with Medicare. Only Medicare has that donut hole. Medicaid does not apply to that. So as long as the patient um, qualifies and they re-enroll every year, then they should be good to go. So this is a very, very good option for those who are low income. So definitely something to look into. All right. All right. Any other questions? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. Let me know if you have any other questions. And yeah, awesome.